Hello and welcome to the podcast BFI Talks, which is brought to you by Prague Finance Institute and the leading Czech economics research center, Serge EI. It is my pleasure to welcome New York University finance professor, Aswath Damodaran. Hello. Hi, how are you? Fine, thank you. Thanks for finding time and let's start right away. Where do you get your energy from? And I will use your own words to keep steering the pot of corporate finance and valuation puzzles and also teach MBA students. You make me sound like an incredibly hardworking person. I'm not. I'm, I'm, I describe myself as uh, naturally lazy. And I just stir myself a few times every day, every week to write about things that I care about. And to stir the pot, all you have to do is not care anymore. And I really don't care what people think about me, what the consequences are. And I'm lucky enough to be in a place to be able to do that. You know? So in a sense, since I've never, and, and, and one of the reasons for that is over my lifetime, I've never done consulting. Hmm. I've not, never done expert witness work. I'm beholden to nobody. And when you're beholden to no one, it gives you the freedom to say whatever's on your mind. And you've been doing that for many years and thanks for that. You know, all your inspiring writing, all your inspiring books. But do you actually get the energy from the students then? Or the freedom? I, you know, I, I, it's a combination. When I teach, you know, you obviously get your energy from your students and almost everything I do is an extension of teaching. So today, I mean, when I write, when I talk, on, when I do my YouTube videos, I'm just, it's an extension of being in the classroom. To me, the difference between 1980 and today is in 1980, when I taught, I had to be in a physical classroom and I was constrained to however many people I could fit into that room, whether it was 50, 100 or 200. Today in virtual space, I can speak to the entire world, not that the entire world is listening, but the potential is there for people to speak to the world, which is a good thing and a bad thing. The, the good thing is you can, you, you as a teacher, it's always nicer to have a bigger audience than a smaller one. And I like having the bigger audience. The downside is everything I say is now recorded in real time and kept online forever. So I have to be, you know, and from that perspective, I have responsibilities that I would not have had for what I said in a classroom. And I try to take that seriously. I very seldom, though I sometimes slip up talk about personalities. I don't talk about other people. I don't talk about because mm. I can go around and bad mouth other people and say that person's stupid and that person says silly things. What, what, what business is it of mine? So I prefer to keep my thoughts on ideas rather than people. Because uh, I think we live in a world where everything becomes a personality cult. Everything becomes personal and I prefer to keep it professional. So I know what my corner of the world is, which is I talk about finance and investing. I know people don't come to read what I say about politics or sports. So I pref even though I have my views on those, it's not my place to thrust those down other people's throats. So it's all teaching for me. And I do get my energy from people who learn from my teaching. It's really interesting what you said, and I like the very healthy approach you have to balancing the facts and, you know, and, and, and your views, personal views on, on very important issues, which actually gives me a great opening for the first question related to finance, because it's going to be on the ESG and finance. And we are getting into the politics and issues of, high, you know, sort of greater social consequences. So specifically, what are your thoughts on the impact of ESG asset valuation and investment decisions? Is there one? I mean, the people who promote ESG claim all kinds of things. But ultimately in investing, the numbers speak for themselves. What I hear with ESG is a lot of smoke and mirrors. Talk mm -hmm. about goodness, but very little. I mean, there was an old commercial in the US for I think Burger King and um, this lady comes in she takes a bite out of a burger in a, in a competing store and she says, where's the beef? And that's a, that's a classic line. Where's the beef? Where's the beef? With ESG, there is no beef here. There is nothing there. This is, I think, the most oversold, overhyped concept in the history of business. I've never seen a concept sold so much with so little going for it. So the problem with ESG is people talk the talk, but there's really nothing to back that. So I think when uh, people talk about ESG being good for companies and good for investors, my reaction is show me. 
show me where you know show me that it can that that it is in fact good for businesses and good for investors because i don't see the evidence i would i would say that some companies trying to raise capital it would tell you yeah what you know if we don't do it we're going to pay more for funds well show me right you can tell you can say whatever you want cfo say all kinds of stupid things doesn't mean that any of it has any basis so if you argue that being a good company lets you raise capital first how many publicly traded companies actually raise new capital only ipos do you know that 95% of existing companies the way they fund themselves with retained earnings so for this notion that public companies are doing it to raise capital is absurd microsoft hasn't been back to the market since 1986 the year of their ipo that's 34 years mm-hmm. so if you're talking about your equity getting cheaper it's not you raising capital it's your investing investors in a sense accepting a lower rate of return for investing in your equity because you're a good company so that actually cuts against your second pitch which is this is good for investors if investors are accepting a lower required return then by definition investors in good companies should earn lower returns not higher ones this is i think fundamentally the problem with esg there is no internal consistency the people who push esg i think either don't understand or have completely forgotten first principles in corporate finance and investing and they go around with the hype saying i will know this is true but there's there's nothing to back it up But that seems to be the sort of a play of the day, you know, Larry Fink of BlackRock keeps talking about that all the funds they're going to start. You know, you know for- I said I'm not going to say anything bad about people, but I'm going to say what I think about BlackRock. BlackRock to to me is to investing what the United Way was to charities in the US. United Way was this old bloated unimaginative charity in the US. We are a company and you were too lazy to find ways for your employees to give to charities you said let's just use the united way we know it's big we know it's bloated we know it's inefficient but it's so convenient there isn't a single new imaginative thing that has come out of blackrock larry fink has created nothing the person who essentially revolutionized passive investing which is where blackrock makes his money is jack bogle so it's true a lot of the establishment has bought into esg CEOs mm-hmm. investors that doesn't make it any better or worse it just means the establishment bo- and if you're a true believer in making the planet a better place you should be should terrify this should terrify you mm-hmm. that you've turned this over into this took smoke and mirror CEOs into corporate CEOs do you really want Larry Fink and Jamie Dimon deciding what's good or bad for the world that's what you've done you you've outsourced what should be your responsibility as a voter as I mean as a citizen to CEOs of companies nothing good has ever come out of doing that so where do you think this all sort of issue is going to actually lead where is it going to end I'll, i'll tell you 10 years from now here's what you're going to see companies are going to be just as good or bad as they are today nothing will have changed You'll have a hundred extra pages of disclosure in every company's annual report telling us how good they are. Consultants and bankers and portfolio managers are going to make a lot of money off ESG. By and selling their services? Overall, <laughs> selling their services. Let's face it, there's a reason McKinsey and Deloitte and KPMG are so excited about ESG. It's a money machine for them. But society overall is actually going to be worse off. because we will allow companies the reason i chose the title that i did for the post at an esg in the paper is i said do you want to sound good or do you want to do good you know what esg is all about sounding good we're doing a really good job of teaching companies what to say and how to act so around inst- others not how to do so instead of talking the talk they should be walking the walk and if you're walking the walk you don't have to talk about esg right Have you noticed that good people never talk about how good they are? I mean, I read everything that I mean, Mother Teresa said. She never said, I'm a holy person. I go to church every Sunday. She didn't have to. The people who go around boasting about how good they are, how they go to church every weekend are the people that terrify me. Because the very fact that you're out there talking about how good you are tells me that you're covering up something. Okay. So let's move to what used to be 
let's call it now pre-ESG, sort of a jour of the day, and and that's value investing or value investment approach versus growth investment approach. It seems like the, the value investment approach is sort of dying off at the moment, seems like. Where do you think it's going to go? Yeah, nothing in investing is permanent. Things ebb and things flow. And I think, you know, rather than think value investing and growth investing, think about investing in companies that are mature companies. That's what value investors predominantly do. Uh, or investing in companies where you're investing based on growth potential. Is one better than the other? Not necessarily. There's just different ways of investing. I tell people, pick what your strength is. If your strength is in assessing what a company has already done, it's in computing every conceivable financial ratio known to man, is in pouring over balance sheets and income statements for the last 500 years, then go be a value investor. That's, your, that's where you're comfortable. If your skill set is in assessing company stories, looking at potential markets, looking at trends in the market, then you should probably invest in growth investing. Fundamentally, is one better than the other? No. But I think each approach gets into trouble when it gets lazy. <laughs> and value investing got lazy. It got lazy because it had a really good century. Century. For 100 years, the 20th century, Value investing, investing in mature companies seem to do much better than investing in growth companies. The way this manifested itself as buying low PE stocks and low price to book stocks delivered higher returns than buying high PE and high price to book stocks. And value investors became lazy. So what about became the, lazy? What yeah. about growth investing? I mean, given the growth multiples. Investing can get just as lazy, right? I'm, I would argue that growth investors are becoming lazy now. Yeah. And are they becoming lazy? Based. Are they becoming lazy because of uh, cheap money, quantitative easing? What's your take on they that? They become lazy because they made so much money so easily for so long. That's how people get lazy is you get you make money without even trying, then you stop trying. So do you think we're going to see last, some we're going to see a turnaround? We're going to see a return to value everything, in the everything. I mean, I'm not sure you're going to return to value in the same way you on the 20th century, but you're going to see cycles where you're going to see three years, one approach wins out. I don't think either approach is decisively going to be the winner going forward because that can't be true. Because if you if you think of one approach is decisively winning, you know what's going to happen, right? The prices of growth stocks are going to get bid up to the point where they're no longer decisive winners. That's why it always ebbs and flows. The price adjusts to whatever the market thinks is the current status quo. And once a price adjusts, your capacity to make easy money goes away. Mm -hmm. What's what do you think is the actual impact of QE on valuation mul multiples? Is there a clear link? As a, as you know, a lot of people keep I'm saying that. Sure Q, I'm not even sure QE has an impact on interest rates. To be quite honest, I think the story that's told is interest rates have been low in Europe and the U.S. because central banks have pumped up money. And I, I'm not disagreeing with the fact that central banks have become much more activist in the last decade in what they do buying government bonds, pumping into these big, you know, big bailout packages. That said, though, for the longest time, we've known what drives interest rates fundamentally are expected inflation and expected real growth. If you have high inflation, I don't care what the central banks do, your interest rates are going to be high. You know what's kept rates low in the last decade? It was a decade of low inflation and anemic growth. Mm -hmm. You have low inflation and anemic growth. You can dance around this as much as you want, but rates are going to be low. To me, low interest rates are a sign of economic malaise, mm -hmm. sickness, not health. And to me, the fact that European risk-free rates are below 0% is not a good sign. It's a sign that markets are negative about the really long term in Europe. Yeah, I think that there, 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 there's, a, there's a school of thought saying that... Uh, the growth in market economies led by the U.S. has actually kind of ended in the 70s. Well, that might be a little too strong. I mean, but let's face it, the U.S. and Europe are mature economies. If I use a corporate life cycle to explain how companies change over the life cycle, countries go through life cycles too, right? Mm -hmm. You start as a young, you know, young in every way, young people, lots of potential, and then you get older and then you get middle-aged. And I think by the 1970s, the US and Europe were 
middle age getting old. And they've continued to age both as economies and as populations. I mean, there's a reason Japan's best days are behind it. Because 60% of its population is over the age of 50. It's very difficult to be a vibrant growth economy when that higher percentage of the population ages. You walk through much of Europe, you're looking at aging populations. Look at the Italians, look, I mean, in, across Europe, you're seeing this phenomenon play out. So I'm not surprised that real growth has been low since the 70s. But in the last decade, do you know that China alone accounted for two thirds of all growth in the global economy? Two thirds of all global growth came from just China. You so, take China out of the equation, real growth in the rest of the world was close to 0%. That's true. Do you think the, I mean, as we still are coping with the COVID pandemic, and as it you know, still keeps wreaking havoc in, in, in Asia, for example, for example, Vietnam was totally out of troubles last year. Now it's a completely locked down country, seems like. You know, the same, the same can be said about Kazakhstan, Central Asian country, you know, India. Um, do you think that actually the sort of Asian economies with their young population will have a better chance to actually emerge much faster and get back on the growth path yeah, post-COVID? When, no, when you think about the arc of history, COVID is a blip in that arc, right? I mean, in a sense, COVID is not going to make the U.S. a high growth economy and it's not going to make China or India a low growth economy. But it's going to create a lot of pain in the near term because not just because economies are slowing down, but because people are dying. So I think that the long-term outlook for, for Asia is strong simply because that's where the people are. I mean, I had a graph I, I put up on my blog post yesterday on Chinese companies where I was able to find the University of Groningen, I think, has this database of world GDP going back to 1AD. 180, think about it. So they've got, I don't even know how they got the data. It's the most amazing database. Mm -hmm. You know, for the first 1700 years from 180 to 1780, GDP was roughly proportional to population. Mm -hmm. Why? Because machines came, before machines came along, the yeah. way you increased output was you had more people. So if you look at 1500, 1600 AD, the two biggest economies in the world were India and China because mm -hmm. half the population of the world lived in India and China. And then you had the Industrial Revolution, which broke the link between population and GDP. And then you had the rise of Europe, because you now could, with a much smaller population producer. You could argue that with technology, maybe we're reverting back to pre-industrial age phenomena. Mm -hmm. Because think of the great companies of today. They're all based on number of users, number of subscribers. Maybe we are reverting back to a population-based Mm -hmm. global economy, which is great news if you're India or China, it's terrible news if you're Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, in a sense, you know, Czechoslovakia can, or, uh, can never punch above, the Czech Republic can never punch above its weight simply because you can't compete against 500 million people no. or a billion people or a billion and a half people in terms of user count. So it, there's an interesting thesis here for somebody who wants to look at this. Maybe there is a reversal back to economies that reflect population size more. Which would be good for and humankind. <laughs> it, I don't know whether it's good or bad. It's just going to change the way we think about the calculus of where companies are and how they get bad. Mm -hmm. Going back to your sort of hardcore expertise, you've been sort of vocal about uh, criticizing acquisitions, you know, companies using acquisitions as their way to grow. What, how do you actually evaluate? Or what, what do you think? What are your thoughts about the mergers acquisition market today? Hasn't it overheated totally? Well, it's, it's uh, I think the, the M&A process has a fundamental problem, which is its structure is extraordinarily unhealthy. And here's what I mean by this. To do an acquisition as a company, who do you have to go to? Who's your intermediary? You go to an investment bank. And what do you ask the investment bank to do? To look at a deal and tell you whether the deal is a good deal. And then you throw in, if the deal happens, you get $50 million, $100 million as your deal fee. If the deal doesn't, 
I give you a kiss on the cheek and say, thank you for the advice. And I leave. Given a choice between a kiss on the cheek and $50 million, I'm going to take $50 million. Yeah. The problem with the m and process is it's hopelessly conflicted. Mm-hmm. It's hopelessly conflicted because the deal makers are the deal advisors. And as long as that is true, you're going to be overpaying for deals. Not that every deal is a bad deal, but the process is skewed towards a lot of bad deals that shouldn't be going through. But because the deal maker is the deal advisor. They make money when the deal is, deal takes place. So the problem with the m and process is it can be fixed. But to fix it, you got to almost reorient the process. You can't have deal advisors be deal makers because it doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. Well, talking about deals, what's your, what's your view on the, on the valuation of SPACs, these buying check companies sort of going through well, the US stock again, market? We're out, yeah, we're in a sense outsourcing responsibility again, right? Because in a, what are we doing as investors? We're saying we're too uninformed, we're too lazy to do our own due diligence on companies going public. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to go to a celebrity. And many of these packs are not run by great investors. They're run by celebrities. In fact, many of them have social media influencers in the ranks because it's all about getting a celebrity to do your due diligence for you. Because remember, unlike a traditional IPO where you get to read the prospectus and decide whether the deal makes sense, in a SPAC, you have outsourced that to the SPAC promoter. So I think it's, I've never believed that investors should outsource that thinking. If it's your money, you have the responsibility to do your own due diligence. So fundamentally, I don't have a problem with SPACs, but the way they're structured is where you give up 20% of the sponsor, that's, that's way too much. Here's what I think is going to happen. The way in which IPOs have traditionally gone to the market is through bankers. That process is broken. It's broken because nobody cares about banker roadshows anymore because we don't really care. We don't trust them. And bankers are terrible at pricing companies. How do we know on the, or on the offering day, take a look at what happens to the stock price of most IPOs. They jump 50, 80, 90%. I could ask my doorman to put a number on a company and I, he'd probably do a better job than asking a banker to price a company. So the traditional process is broken down and we don't have a replacement yet. So one reason SPACs have boomed in the last two years is because the traditional process is broken down. People say, let's try something else. My guess is that both processes will evolve and become more efficient over time. You continue to see SPACs, but without the 20% slots, maybe 5%, 6%, with sponsors who actually know what they're doing. And the traditional banking IPO is going to see costs come down as well, because why am I paying 6% to a banker who has no idea what he or she is doing? I should be paying 2%. So I think you're going to see some change in the IPO process simply because the existing process is not working. So specs are actually going to be praised for what you described, cleaning up the mess and these sort of conflict in interests in traditional IPOs. So, yeah, and but it's I think we're still early in the SPAC process. The process itself will change over time because 20% is way too much. That's That slice is way too much for what I get in return for being in a SPAC. Mm-hmm. Well, talking about 20% uh, fees, you know, most of the world's billionaires have gotten richer during the recent, you know, economic downturns. We can actually use plural. What does it tell us about the market efficiency in terms What of... What does it tell us about our, ourselves? That's really the question we need to ask. Why have Facebook and Amazon and Apple and Google and Tencent become wealthier during covid Well, because we all spend more time online, right? It's amazing how we point fingers outwards when four of the fingers are pointing back at us. Mm -hmm. You know why Amazon's doing so well? Because we needed stuff and we needed stuff while we're sitting at home. And the only company that we seem to be able to trust to deliver things the next day was Amazon. Why is Apple more valuable? Because we were stuck at home and all day long, all we were doing was checking our iPhones and our iPads and our Apple MacBooks. So in a sense, the companies are reflecting what you, I mean, these are not things that happen exogenously. It's actions we take as consumers that have made these companies more valuable. 
So you don't want these people to be billionaires? Well, don't use Amazon. Stop checking your Apple phone. Do you think off social media? Yeah. Can we do that? Who wants to do that, right? Can That's we do that? Thing. None of us wants to do that. We want to complain. We want. See, the problem is, I think we live in a world where we want other people to fix our messes. Mm. We want corporate CEOs to be our consciences because we're too lazy and we want convenience. You know, we want um, you want SPAC sponsors to do due diligence on our investing. And on this dimension, we want governments to come in and protect us from ourselves. Please, please, government, stop me from being on Amazon Prime. No, this is no way to be a grown-up human being. I mean, but that's, I think, the problem we face is we all want other people to do the heavy lifting, but we want to do all the things we've always done is drive our SUVs, you know, and you know, use, you know, and complain about climate change after we've flown in a jet to some meeting in Davos. I mean, come on, spare me the hypocrisy. And you know, and if you don't like things, start with your own actions. So do you think we can get out of this sort of a, you know, treadmill of being lazy and at the same time sort of uh, pointing at others for our, for our perceived problems? I don't know. Maybe we need a shock. Maybe COVID was one of those shocks. And once in a while, nature has its way of delivering shocks. It says, wake up to humankind. Through, through all of our existence. Let's hope we don't need that shock to be so painful. Mm -hmm. no? yeah. And I think that's, you know, that, that's the reality is if you're lazy, the shock will come, whether it'll be through climate change or through diseases or pandemics that occur every 10 years. Trust me, nature is its own way of evening the playing field. And I think that we need to wake up to that. When we started our wonderful chat earlier today, you know, a couple of minutes ago, a few minutes ago, you said you are a natural lazy person, but at the same time, you seem to be very outspoken about sort of look at look at the mirror, look at yourself, and you know, only then speak up, only then speak out. Is that is that your way of actually doing what we've just discussed? Sort of like you know, talking, not talking the talk, but walking the walk. I'll tell you, the person it's most difficult to be honest with looks you in the mirror every morning. It's yourself. Human beings are capable of the most incredible delusions. And I'm not alone. I'm, 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 I'm human. I, I can fool myself if I want to. I am, you know, I'm capable of rationalizing everything I do. So one of the things I've discovered I need to do is be honest with myself. One of the reasons I write my blog, which is where much of my writing happens for the first time. Eventually, it might become a book or a paper, but I always start my writing with a blog. And the reason I write the blog is not so much for other people, but so that I can put my thoughts down in real time on paper for everybody to see. And that way, three months from now, I can't say, well, I never said that. Notice how many experts conveniently forget everything they've said. You watch them on CNBC or on Bloomberg TV, and they're saying something. And you remember four months ago, they were saying exactly the opposite thing, but they don't even bring it up. It's almost like that whole episode has been scrubbed from their minds and online. I can't run away from what I've said, and I don't want to. And part of the reason I write I know I value companies and I put down when I, I mean, yesterday, for instance, I wrote a blog post in Chinese tech companies because they've been punished this year. And at the end of the post, after looking at Alibaba and Tencent and DD and JD.com, I said, I'm buying Tencent. And I said, no, keep note of this date. And when I buy it, because I know you'll hold me accountable. Mm -hmm. In what sense? If a year from now, Tencent is down 25%, I'm going to hear from people saying, hey, no. What do you think about that investment you made a year ago? And I want that to be the case. Now, I tell people I'd rather be transparently wrong than opaquely right. And what I mean by that is I want to put my thoughts down on paper, be very clear about how I got to the decision that I did. So when I screw up, I can go back and say, that's where I screwed up on Tencent. I got that number wrong or that estimate wrong. I'd rather do that then be one of these experts who says, on the one hand, on the other hand, on the third hand, and by the time they're done, you have no idea whether they're telling you whether the market's going up, going down, or doing nothing. The advantage of being opaque is this way you're mm -hmm. right no matter what happens. 
I have no interest in doing that. I see too many people essentially hiding behind these opaque statements. No, I don't like to use the word may. Mm -hmm. The market may go up. What, what does that even mean? The market may go up. Oh no, why do you need me to tell you that? Of course the market may go well, up, it, it may, may go down, down, it may do nothing. May is such a weak word, but you see how many experts say, oh, the market may be in trouble. Yeah. You may be in trouble. You may be hit by a truck on your way out of the studio. I mean, May tells me absolutely nothing. And I try as best as I can not to kind of straddle differences. Mm -hmm. That's why in ESG, I could turn the one hand and the other hand. And that way I'd be safer. But I don't want to be safe. There are too many people playing it safe. I'd much rather be open about my thoughts, even if they're wrong and say, this is where how I got to where I am on this question. Doesn't mean I'm done. I'm willing to keep learning. I can change my mind. But if I do change my mind, I will let you know that I've changed my mind and why I've changed my mind. Says Athwas Damodaram, finance professor at the Stern Business School at New York University. Thank you very much for giving us your time from San Diego and goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>